Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Mosh Sustainability Dialogues podcast, where we take a deeper dive into this massive push towards sustainability that we're seeing, of course, across the region as well as around the world, trying to uncover some insights and intelligence that will help our stakeholders out on the journey ahead. Um, we're in a situation right now, too, where I think it's less than 100 days to COP28, uh, very much solution uh, stock take oriented focused, um, of course, which our topic is touching on today, which is pathways to COP28. How can we achieve both sustainable mo mobility and a just transition? We're joined here today with our host for Mashrek, Badar Chowdhury, head of energy sector for Mashrek, and as well as our special guest speakers, Paul Shebel, who is the vice president of strategy and sustainability for Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia at Alstom, Kevin Shalhoub, who is the CEO and founder of EV Lab, and Ala Albusiam, who is the CEO of Middle East for Aegis. Thank you all for joining the show. Uh, Bader, I just wanted to bring you in as host. Of course, this is a big topic. Uh, there's a lot of momentum heading into COP28. I just wanted to get your opening comments to start us off for the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome uh, to to the audience and uh, our guest speakers. Um, on behalf of Mashrik, we're delighted to have you uh, join this uh, podcast. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I think uh, in the sort of lead up to COP28, there are a number of industry verticals which uh, will always, you know, have the the significance or will gain uh, sort of attract um, a lot of eyes in terms of you know what are the developments happening with respect to the energy transition um, mobility i think is one of those which uh, has had a good um, start um, at least in some markets for sure uh, but i think it promises to be one of those leading uh, sectors which can uh, sort of adopt towards the uh, trans uh, sustainable uh, uh, energy or sustainable transition um, i think it's like any any sector the most important consideration at this stage is that the transition um is not is not disproportionately burdening uh, marginalized communities um it it does it creates equalities for all the um sort of uh, so, so, sort of um uh, sort of economies uh, of the region and it, it, in terms of infrastructure uh, in, investment uh, the the opportunities are uh, available across the across the economies so uh, as a, as one of the oldest uh, privately owned banks in uae uh, we foresee that there will be significant investments um in the uh, sustainable mobility uh, for the region uh, uh, Mashrik, um, as uh, the uh, as one of the leading financial institutions of the market, has already committed uh, to finance um, uh, sustainable financing of approximately 30 billion by 2030, and we believe that a fair size of this um, of this uh, so commitment will go towards uh, mo sustainable mobility. Thank you very much for your comments, Bader. Uh Paul, I just wanted to first kick off with you. Uh, you know, as Butter mentioned, there's a massive amount of opportunity heading in towards this transition towards more sustainable mobility. But of course, there's a balance. There's challenges on on the road ahead. I just want to start with you with your opening comments on the overall topic. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, for hosting us. Um, so, as you mentioned, this is a really important topic as we head to, to towards COP28 and in general. I think uh, Bader mentioned that you know mobility is is a critical sector. If you think about emissions globally, about 25% are coming from mobility. So decarbonizing, uh, you know, the mobility sector is critical, right? Um, and it's a combination of uh, you know the right investments, the right innovation, the right access that we can provide. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, us at Alsom being one of the global leader in uh, the rail sector. Uh, we do have a wide spectrum of solutions that are uh, environmentally friendly, uh, and we continuously try to invest and innovate to, uh, you know, improve the efficiency of our solution. 
Um, and, and maybe one quick uh, comment around kind of accessibility and equity uh, in terms of what role do we do we have to play in terms of uh, creating that access to mobility, right? So we, we see mobility as an enabler for economic development. So always the balance of not burdening developing economy with, with you know, sustainability goals and preventing them from reaching their economic development goals. That's a critical uh, part that we always keep in mind. Uh, and, you know, partnering with um, uh, the likes of Mashrik and other uh, reputable banks to bring the financing to allow developing countries to be able to invest and achieve their goals. That's a bit kind of uh, where where we, we are focusing uh, these days. And just to follow up to, the, to that, uh, how do you find that balance of, of not burdening, uh, you know, progress with innovation? I imagine innovation is very much a sprint especially in mobility we see everything from drones to ai to trains that are being produced uh, you know that rapid you know transport at the end of the day how do you make that balance and then still make sure that we're hitting our sustainable development goals uh, absolutely so in reality yes there's a lot of innovation uh, there's a lot of new technology that we're seeing but ultimately one of the shortest path to decarbonization is moving from individual motorization towards shared mobility uh, and specifically on rail. If you compare rail to other modes of transport, uh, you know, it's about 10 to 12 times more efficient in terms of energy consumption and it emits five to 10 times less uh, CO2. So just by making not, you know, the, the leapfrog to the latest technology, just by moving from individual motorization and putting in place either urban mobility, trams, metros, uh, monorails, or, uh, you know, suburban rail, that's one step uh, which at, is at the, uh, if you want, accessible to all, uh, uh, you know, uh, economies and countries from a technology point of view. This is one way to, uh, to start that journey towards de decarbonization. Kevin, I just wanted to bring you in for, for your opening comments. Of course, there's rail, but also EVs. Uh, the take up of EVs um, and you know the accessibility of that segment as well. I just want to get your overall opening comments on sure. the Sure. Um, uh, just uh, um, <clears throat> building on what Paul says, uh, especially around emissions. Uh, uh, I mean, it's 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 important to know. You know, transportation and electricity are the two most emitting sectors in our world. So, fifty percent of the emissions are coming from those two um, um, sectors. 25 about half and half you know um, i think i think electricity has a bit more emissions um um uh, the the good news is the solutions are here uh, and they are accessible both in electric cars and renewable energy um so 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 really this this cop i think is is really going to be focused uh, about <clears throat> solutions um we all know the problems and potential problems that could arise and and what's exciting is that um is that um you know we're we're um uh, uh the uae is really uh one of those countries that is so forward looking um uh, uh, and and uh, is the first foreign direct investor in renewable energy projects worldwide actually more than any other nation um uh, and and it's a very solution driven country so so um so yeah in terms of transportation and, and electric cars in general they're becoming more and more accessible um as we speak uh, economies of scale are growing uh, uh there's a lot of production of, of electric cars um it's no longer just tesla there's so many brands i just went to to, to visit a couple in uh, asia a couple in uh, 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 Europe as well, and 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 it's so exciting, and and it's constantly about battery progress, uh, creating more range, more performance, and that's also developing fast. Uh, uh, but the the exciting news is that the UAE is one of the countries um, that could adopt EVs the fastest, especially given that we don't have that long distances to drive uh, compared to other markets. So. Um, you know, the, the longest distance, at least within the country, most people would do would go, be to go to Abu Dhabi and back. If you need to go go further, um, you can always recharge, find um, uh, charging spots. Um, and when we're, we're one of the nations with the biggest density of chargers for uh, electric cars on the road. So it's 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 great to note that. So I'm very excited for the COP that's, that's coming up. 
in terms of uh, scaling up, you know, scaling up of economies, scaling up of technologies, uh, you know, energy sector, we've seen this with carbon capture, for example, it's a technology that's been there for a while and still has some scaling up to do at the moment. From your perspective, when it comes to AVs, adoption and scaling up those batteries, where do you see the challenges at the moment? What do you think can be done to help accelerate that process? Um, yeah, I think we need more volume, whether it's it's uh, hydrogen trains, hydrogen car, uh, uh, cars or electric cars, um, uh, battery electric cars, because technically hydrogen are also electric. But um, uh, yeah, so 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 it's it's about scale um as scale grows uh demand uh you know there's already more demand than supply in most countries um so some i'm really uh not worried about that point oh i just want to bring you in there as well uh, of course scaling up is is a key aspect to achieve both sustainable mobility and a just transition uh, i just want to get your opening comments on the overall theme yeah, uh, good afternoon and thanks for having us and uh, thanks to our hosts and, and the audience following us today. Uh, I think this is a, a very interesting time to be in the Middle East in particular, uh, you know, having two back-to-back -back cops in the region and uh, an opportunity really uh, uh, to showcase how we're going to promote growth, but at the same time be able to decouple this growth from negative impact on, on, on the environment. And mobility in the Middle East has been uh, 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 sort of lagging behind when it comes to implementation in the region, although we see some pioneering cities moving in the right direction. Uh, but if you compare us to uh, cities who have advanced elsewhere, you know, we still rely on 90 percent of our trips on cars. Uh, public transport is still on, on the back foot when it comes to utilization and ridership. Uh, so there is a lot to be done uh, in terms of uh, uh, what's our role as, as innovators, as engineers to support uh, uh, putting a framework uh, and policies that promote action on, on sustainable mobility. Like Kevin said, a lot of the technologies already exist. Uh, a lot of the initiatives around uh, upgrading of public transport, electrification, shared mobility, uh, uh, and micromobility, and, and designing uh, 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 new cities is, is in place but taking it to a, a bigger scale through moving from static traffic systems to more dynamic uh, uh, bi-directional uh, uh, static systems, maybe approaching uh, things around open uh, data principles, allowing startups to innovate uh, uh, while protecting uh, local data privacy, uh, of course. Uh, so there is a lot uh, to be uh, uh, implemented and it remains a very exciting uh, space for the, for the uh, new generation because you combine uh, engineering and technology with uh, sustainability KPIs with digital, and you have everything that really excites uh, 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 new engineers and, and the pipeline of talent and, and, uh, and human capital. Uh, so it's it's a very exciting space that uh, aligns very well with, with our purpose, even as a firm in, in Aegis being in the Middle East for the last uh, uh, 30 years or so. Just as a, a follow-up, what would you say are the next steps to get to implementation. So we've we've had visions, we've we've had announcements, uh, you know, COP28 is is a point in time, but even further beyond 2030, 2050. What what next steps do you think industry can do to help accelerate that implementation uh, to reach Im these ambitious climate targets that have been set? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I can probably summarize uh, the next steps probably in in four main uh, pillars, you know, if we talk about infrastructure in itself, uh, uh, the legacy infrastructure is all geared around uh, uh, vehicles and, and, and privately owned cars. So uh, 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 governments have been uh, moving in that direction where infrastructure, uh, especially as we see mega new cities, mega projects and, and very important developers, either in UAE and Saudi and Egypt and, and elsewhere, uh, uh, adapting this uh, new infrastructure for EVs and, and uh, new strategies around autonomous uh, vehicles and so on, but still to be seen how much of the total investment will go into that uh, direction. Uh, the second pillar, I would say technology, you know, uh, we need to deal with this as, you know, there's an imminent threat in terms of uh, how much we can, uh, 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 or the planet can tolerate and deal with it with that mindset in terms of adapting technology and, and really uh, uh, sorts of, you know, like we responded to COVID, you know, when, when we fast track technology and implementation. 
the third one, I would say policies, and and uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, this requires behavioral change uh, in many ways to change how we actually uh, move from one place to another. So uh, putting the incentives in place in, in terms of uh, you know people focused uh, policies that that uh, uh, enhance uh, new new modes or new behaviors. And then the last one, which is uh, uh, very important to talk about, is the funding. Where is it all going to come from? The, the, the sort of cost sharing and, and, and sharing of risks and, and benefits across all and, and climate financing instruments uh, and the access to those. Uh, so a combination of these four things and implementation, I think, will get us uh, 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 moving in the right direction. Paul, I just wanted to, to come back to you on that. Of course, COP28 is the global stock take. Everyone is looking at implementation, you know, some points on the board as we head into this one big moment again in time. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that uh, based off what Allah said and, and what you think are the specific strategies that need to be implemented now in order to accelerate that next step, moving away from the visions more into blueprints and implementation. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, Allah covered uh, obviously the main factors. Uh, so uh, for us, policies uh, are very important. Uh, we are in a country where, you know, we're still young nations in the, in the, in the region. Uh, and our development was geared towards individual transport in the past. We've seen, we're seeing a lot of, to be fair, we're seeing a lot of projects see life, right? I mean, if you think about what's happening in, in, in KSA, for instance, uh, you know, Riyadh Metro, one of the largest uh, metros, uh, you know, to be developed at once, uh, is seeing the light now, uh, you know, a lot of movement in the UAE uh, with the Tihad Rail. So uh, there is there is movement and there are, you know, projects that seeing light. Um, what I would add to a lot is a bit of a, you know, partnerships and collaboration uh, in a sense. How do we really uh, so, you know, it links to funding, but ultimately, how do we create these these partnerships that are, you know, sustainable for private sector to come in and actually play? Because uh, ultimately, you know, uh, you know, as a private sector, it needs to, to make financial sense, right? So, and and these in mega infrastructure projects are typically uh, not the most profitable. So, what kind of partnership, what kind of uh, uh, different funding mechanism can we can we uh, unlock to be able to uh, you know accelerate this? Uh, and lastly, is uh, I think as consumers, uh, they we need to play a bigger role in terms of really asking for these solutions, right? Uh, there's, you see a bit of a mindset, P younger generation are much more, uh, you know, uh, focused on sustainability and their own footprint. So how do we really activate that segment of the population to push, uh, you know, decision makers to, to, to fast track and implement a lot of these projects? Just on that, that financing aspect as well, what role does, uh, transparency, reporting, uh, understanding the metrics of impact for investment play in these mega projects. Uh, where do you see that at its current stage and what role do you think you would play in order to draw in more investment? Um, yeah, look, when it comes to kind of metrics and KPIs, I think we're always focused on financial metrics. I think to unlock some of the thinking is, um, you know, transport and rail specifically, uh, um, as I mentioned, is more of an economic enabler, right? So can we look at really the development and the acceleration of development that these projects are going to drive, uh, especially when you have other competing industries that also are, are asking for funding? So once you start looking at a, at a broader picture and a more holistic view of what is the real impact, and not specifically only on the financial implication, I think you start seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the funding getting unlocked and, uh, you know, uh, banks, uh, as better at the beginning mentioned, they're now also focused a lot on sustainable financing and green financing, and that will work uh, in the, you know, uh, recently rail has been included as part of the, the, the sectors and uh, products that are eligible for this kind of financing. So we think that will also help, uh, uh, you know, accelerating access to these funds. Kevin, I just wanted to bring you in on, on that aspect as well, of course, as an entrepreneur, founder of EV Lab, very much involved in the SME space as well. Um, what are your thoughts on the partnerships and collaboration aspects of driving this forward, then also in terms of developing those partnerships to draw in further investment and then allow more exposure for sustainable mobility uh, companies like yourself? 
I, I think um, impact investing is becoming really uh, an important topic uh, nowadays. So, so an, anyone that's looking for for investment uh, is is increasingly looking to to also make an impact, a positive impact uh, with that investment, whatever that may be. So, um, you know, in the world of startups, you go through venture capital. Uh, uh, processes, uh, uh, but there is increasing amounts of venture capital that are looking at clean tech uh, uh, as a um, uh, funding uh, uh, opportunity. And, and that's exciting for startups out there. Uh, uh, also, like uh, AV Lab, there is uh, uh, also a lot of funding for, uh, for more, more classical types of funding for renewable energy projects uh, 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 out there. Um, so um yeah i i think that i like the biggest thing and and a big discussion both at the un in in september at, at cop is how to align the financial incentives and the environmental one and uh, rather than that what is good for for us uh uh um uh and 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 how can we uh finance these things so so as long as there is alignment and we can talk about carbon taxes we can talk a bit, a bit about uh, or, or even, uh, I'm more of, of the opinion you can you can positively um, uh, reward uh, people that act towards renewables. So, so, so uh, rather than than doing uh, uh, taxes, uh, but but I do think it's it's important to to focus on aligning these incentives. I just also wanted to touch on a point that Paul made: is the role that we as consumers play in in this transition. Uh, obviously, education plays a big part of that. Uh, what is your perspective from that aspect? How do we uh, educate in this aspect of sustainability in order to accelerate where we want to be? Absolutely. I mean, education is is key um, in every uh, everyone's uh, uh, mission. Um, for us at EV Lab, uh, for example, uh, uh, um, you know that's what we're here for to help people choose the best product for them. There's a lot of factors uh, when considering buying or releasing an EV. Uh, uh, what's the range? How much? Uh, 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 how fast does it accelerate? Um, how um, how sustainable uh, is it? Is it really better than combustion engine? Is it better than hydrogen or less uh, emitting than hydrogen cars? Um, uh, all those questions we're, we're here to answer. How do you charge? How fast do you charge? So education in each aspect is important. And um, what's exciting about electric cars is that we truly believe that they're, they're products that are not just better for the environment, but also simply better quality, safer, more reliable. Um, and, and, so, and so they're no brainer. We're, we're gonna see a very, very, the, the industry is gonna grow very fast. That's what, um, and, and, and it's an exciting time for the automotive industry. Oh, I just wanna bring you in as well. Uh, in order to do this, we have one yes, education of consumers, uh, but also talent, uh, the need to educate that next generation for sustainability capital, which we have a, a lot of conversations around the region, of course. And it seems like talent in sustainability, of course, is in high demand, but it's a struggle getting there at the moment. Uh, what are the next steps in order to achieve that? And, and where do you see things currently in the region uh, in terms of advancing that space? Yeah, I think uh, this is a really you touch on a very important subject because uh, that's what we need to to fuel in addition, obviously, to financing is the people to to execute, and uh, uh, you know the private sector here we, we all have a big role to play in terms of uh, training and knowledge transfer, especially of the ha being in the Middle East with the long term visions with the young population and and with the really uh, uh, keen attitude towards uh, uh, localization of resources. So. By combining, uh, bringing the talent, the experts from all around the world uh, uh, in combination with uh, promoting and, and, and training and, and uh, the local population in the different uh, uh, countries in the Middle East, I think we can go a long way in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, uh, for this uh, future uh, requirement. But also, I think looking at this uh, subject, and, and it's what's really interesting is, is that uh, uh, this is an economic driver. The sustainable mobility could be an economic driver by itself uh, in terms of employment and 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 uh, job security, uh, because uh, you know there was a recent study by PwC that suggested uh, uh, 
the GCC alone could unlock more than $400 billion worth of economic value by investing in sustainable mobility. Uh, uh, you know, uh, more than 100 billion could be just avoiding spending more money on, on roads and bridges and tunnels if you divert that into rail networks and, and, and uh, public transport. Uh, you know, if you can improve the road safety uh, uh, and accidents and the consequences of that. Uh, uh, to what extent you can increase productivity, you know, people can get things done when they are on public transport as opposed to being stuck in traffic uh, uh, like we see in many of our cities still. In addition to the impact of uh, reducing emissions and, and, and uh, what you achieve in terms of energy efficiency if you electrify your, your, your fleet and so on. So all of this, you know, uh, requires uh, 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 the talent to, to, to be part of this journey. And, and from a job security perspective, this gives them the, the, uh, the path uh, uh, as long as together governments and private sector get together and, and, and put the required uh, training programs and, and, and uh, uh, create those paths for uh, younger generations. And what specific skill sets are we looking for? You know, we're, we're training for paths, sustainability, for example. I had a conversation with the CSO of a fashion company the other, the other day. That was head of sustainability for a mining company in, in their history. Yeah, so it kind of seems like there, there's a path towards it, but sustainability is always evolving. What yeah. specific skill sets do you see will be most in demand for the labor market for that next generation? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, 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 from a technical point of view, uh, there is significant uh, uh, requirement with the amount of data generated from uh, different mobility uh, uh, modes uh, for, for, for data science and machine learning and, and AI driven uh, applications. So that's going to be with us for, for many, many years to come. Uh, sustainability in itself and, and but specialized sustainability, you know, talk, you talk about energy modeling, you talk about uh, 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 on a math, at the master plan level, a city level, and then down to the asset level and, and the different uh, 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 planning routes as well. So there is a lot to be uh, uh, looked at uh, technically, but also, I think also uh, uh, there is still uh, a lot of uh, uh, training required around uh, uh, the ability to be uh, creative or finding the, the creativity spark in, 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 in pools of uh, uh, graduates that will uh, maybe find or, or create models that we don't even think about today. And, and how do we identify and nurture uh, that entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirit uh, that combined with the technical skills uh, uh, could lead us to, to, uh, uh, towards an improved position uh, from where we are today. Paul, I just wanted to bring you in as well on that topic. Uh, again, upskilling, uh, developing that sustainability talent uh, I imagine you know, as a massive organization driving the lead in sustainable mobility, it starts internally and works outward. Uh, where do you see where we're at right now? And, and again, what do you think are the specific strategies that need to be implemented to accelerate that aspect in terms of human talent and capital? Yeah. Um, so internally, I'll start with internally. I think uh, Beyond just the talent, uh, we'll get to that, but there's also a bit of a culture and mindset that we need to bring from an organization point of view, uh, where kind of sustainability is part of our DNA. Uh, so when you say which talent, I would I would argue it goes across the entire organization. You know, everyone has a role, even if I think about, you know, uh, finance. How are we accounting for, you know, gains of, in sustainability? What, how are we tracking? Uh, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, metrics are we keeping in mind? From a policy point of view, uh, legal, uh, how do we now bake in all of these sustainability metrics in our contract? How do we make sure that we have the right elements uh, uh, in place? And you go into, I mean, I love that last comment about creativity. How do we keep pushing our, our you know, engineering department to come up with more sustainable uh, solution from, you know, energy efficiency, from new kind of uh, propulsion uh, systems. Then we mentioned the AI, uh, you know, how do we use data analytics uh, to make sure that our solutions, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, we have an internal sol solution uh, today that looks at the data of all of the movement of the train and start thinking about, you know, what can be done, what messages can be sent to drivers for them to improve the way they're driving so that the machine itself improves in efficiency. 
how do we automate this? So I think it's it's a it's a real spectrum, a broad spectrum, and also I would I would push a bit more and say, you know, uh, uh, Kevin mentioned batteries. You know, uh, this is where you know what kind of innovation, what kind of new uh, engineerings and then uh, uh, technologies that we want to push in that uh, in that space to continue providing solutions that are much more efficient. Um, so it's it's really a, a broad spectrum that you you would argue every talent group within an organization if they have that mindset if they had that push they will contribute in one way or another to achieve those goals. Kevin, we talk about mindset, culture, uh, sustainability, of course, crossing everything. Uh, we've spoken to sustainability teams here in the region. They keep them sometimes small because they don't want to take away from developing that culture mindset because it is integrated throughout everything. But from your perspective, uh, what do you see as the next crucial steps in order to embed that culture and mindset and then also scale that up across? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we're looking at uh, uh, people uh, uh, from our perspective, we, we really uh, uh, look at both um, skill sets and, and culture. And when I say culture, we want people that are selfless, uh, uh, egoless, uh, that are purpose driven, that are looking to to make an impact, um, uh, and and that's that's very important to us. Uh, uh, from a um, uh, skill sets uh, uh, perspective, I'd say um, you know all skill sets are, are 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 welcome in the world of sustainability. There's a lot of work to do, um, whether it's finance, marketing, sales. Uh, engineering, of course, uh, that goes without saying, as Alain Ball mentioned. Um, um, uh, but but all of it um, is is uh, is accessible. I mean, if if you want to make a positive impact, this is one of the the, the good fields that is definitely uh, definitely going to be growing. Um, and how do you embed it in in the organization? Uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, uh, good uh, uh, activities around the theme of sustainability can always be fun. Uh, it can be fun to to be sustainable too. So, um, giving me ideas also, uh, Brian. <laughs> it seems like thirty minutes goes by pretty fast on these podcasts, but I just wanted to get one quick sound bite uh, again from around the room, uh, very quickly. Uh, Allah, starting with you, we have COP twenty eight coming up. What are you looking for as one key aspect coming out of COP28 in order to accelerate sustainable infrastructure and transportation? Yeah, I think uh, to conclude maybe where we started is, uh, yes, we want this transition and we're all uh, committed to champion it and the entire world will be with us in, in the UAE to, to, to go into that uh, journey together. But uh, we have to ensure that this transition is just it serves uh, access to all that uh, uh, sustainable mobility represents a, a safe green. Paul, I just want to also bring in you for your quick final thoughts, COP28. What are you looking at the top of your list to see develop? Um, so for, for COP28, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a great opportunity that we have it in the UAE and in the you know, broader region. Uh, what I would like to see is, is you know, commit not just commitment but action. So, uh, really, we've mentioned a lot, uh, a lot of you know decisions are made, but then implementation falls through. We've we've uh, we've discussed a bit what is required for implementation. So, so I'd really like to see some, you know, real actions. Uh, and uh, you know, for our region, for the Middle East in general, given that this is in our backyard. I'm hopeful that this will transpire to immediate action taken. And Kevin, of course, action, acceleration. What are your final thoughts leading into impact? Uh, I think I think it would be nice um, to really, um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things to say. Really, it's it's, but to, to make it simple. Um, we're, we need to act now. Um, there's a 40 year lag between cause and effect when it comes to climate change. So we won't have the same opportunity that we had with COVID to be reactive about things. We'll need to be proactive. And this is the opportunity we have a COP. We need to be proactive uh, uh, about our messaging. And, and we need to bring this to the same scale as COVID. You know, um, if we're talking about global catastrophes, 
pandemics are one, climate change is one. And we need to really be able to communicate on a daily basis. What are the emissions of every country? How are we reducing them? Um, we need to be able to see that that information on Google, um, as we did during uh, during uh, uh, COVID, um, uh, which sectors are transporting, and we need to to create that accountability for every country. So, so I'm actually really excited to see what comes what God brings up, and and I'm hoping that's actually uh, going to be one of the positive outcomes. Thanks for your comments, and and just to wrap up. Um, I'd like to bring our host back into the conversation as well to give his uh, closing comments. Badar, uh, we would like to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much, Brian. And um, I'd, I'd like to thank all our guest speakers as well. Um, I think they've um, comprehensively captured the entire essence of you know what um, we are looking towards uh, realizing. You know the the transition um, and the the sort of overall carbon reduction uh, sort of objectives uh, at the global uh, scale uh, in particular in the region um, and as suggested i think uh, from from our point of view uh, the most important consideration is going to be policy making and incentivized implementation um, i will give you one example um, in the US, if you buy um, the most popular uh, EV that is there currently, there is a rebate that is offered upfront to every purchaser, right? That's that that is what drives you know customer behavior. That drives you know a sort of a social pressure. Uh, it sort of leads into all sort of uh, sort of activities around that space, right? So. Financial institutions will be more geared up to you know, support that sort of initiative. So the entire cycle starts to drive that way. So from 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 a bank's perspective, one of the most, of course, uh, um, critical uh, sort of aspect is going to be policy making and its implementation. Well, thank you very much, Butter, for your, your closing comments. And, and again, thank you to our special guest speakers, Paul, Kevin, Allah. Thank you for your insights. Uh, for all those listening and watching, please feel free to follow them on social media as well for updates. And of course, follow Mashrek, where we will be posting this podcast, as well as content harvested from our discussion. But thank you very much, all of you, for joining today. We look forward again to having you on in the future.